I've been interested in uh, eclipse experiments for students for about 20 years. Um, I think this is an important uh, thing because it's a fun and educational and exciting uh, way to get students interested in science. Now, the students here today are already interested in science, but uh, that's okay. That doesn't mean uh, you can't do these experiments. You're still allowed. I'm going to tell, tell you about two different kinds of experiments today. Uh, and I've designed these experiments so that the mathematical um, knowledge that's required can be, uh, uh, well, the experiments can be tailored for the mathematical background of the students that's, that are involved in the experiment. Um, the other thing that I always insist on is that my experiments should require a minimum amount of attention during the total phase of the eclipse so that both the student and the mentor can enjoy the event. So the first uh, experiment I'm going to talk to you about is the flash spectrum. And uh, this flash spectrum is called that because it's only visible for just a few seconds uh, during second contact and third contact. That is, just as the total phase of the eclipse is beginning and ending. And what happens is that just before second contact, the moon has covered the yellow photosphere of the sun. Uh, but it hasn't covered the corona. So um, we get light from the corona into our cameras. And if we run that through a diffraction grating, then we can get a spectrum of the solar corona. So that's what this is about. Um, later, if you uh, have recorded this with a camcorder, you can uh, use a computer to grab a frame of the spectrum and analyze it. Uh, this is a still photo. This is a frame grab of the uh, spectrum. And you can see spe uh, spectral lines here. So discrete lines superimposed upon the continuous spectrum. Um, and this one was taken with a 500 lines per millimeter diffraction grating. Uh, if you don't know what a diffraction grating is, I have one here. And uh, if you'll stop by my poster during tea, you can, you can see it. Um, I do have a QuickTime movie, uh, but it's on my iPad. I can show that to you, and you can see the spectrum as it develops. It's about a three-minute uh, video, and so again, if you stop by my poster, I'll show it to you. So um, what we see here is individual spectral lines that correspond to individual elements that are present in the corona. So if you can figure out what these wavelengths are, you can figure out what elements are existing in the solar corona. Uh, so if you frame grab this, what I did is I cut it out and I turned it around. Uh, that's OK. Um, I just turned it around because the blue wavelengths are short wavelengths and the red wavelengths are long wavelengths. So what you do is you um, measure the distance from any arbitrary point to each of these spectral lines. And then the distance corresponds to the wavelength. Of course, it has to be calibrated. And we do this in a spreadsheet. So what I have here is uh, each of the distances from my arbitrary origin to each spectral line. And so this is my raw data. Um, does anybody know what the sun is made of predominantly? Hydrogen and helium are the big things. So you, we would expect that our strongest lines correspond to hydrogen and helium. And the hydrogen spectrum is well known, as is the helium spectrum. So we can use this as an internal calibration. Okay. So I pick those lines, and I use them to calibrate. And once I'd done the calibration, I could figure out the wavelengths of the other lines. And then you can look up in tables uh, what those wavelengths, uh, what elements are responsible for those wavelengths. And so we see here, I'm having a little bit trouble focusing this morning. Uh, we see here iron. This wavelength <laughs> corresponds to a wavelength that's known in iron. And we also see some titanium, maybe some cerium. Probably not cerium. Cerium is a very heavy element, and so it may not be present in the sun uh, in a large abundance. 
So this is probably titanium. Uh, we also see, what else do we see here? There's uh, some calcium and the various elements that you can see in the spectrum. Okay, so in summary, um, from this experiment, the student can learn about the science of spectroscopy. Each element has its unique spectroscopic fingerprint, and by finding the wavelengths, uh, you can tell what elements are present. And the math topics that can be involved, depending on the expertise of the student, we can include uh, linear regression, uncertainty propagation. Um, you'll notice that this spectrum, I've used a linear calibration. It's a very nice straight line. <clears throat> and you may wonder how this can be, because after all, the grading equation has that sign of theta term in it. So you wouldn't expect it to be linear. However, if you do a Taylor series expansion and uh, think about the remainder theorem and things like this, you can understand why the spectrum uh, calibration should be linear. Um, we also need uh, computer skills, <clears throat> including video and spreadsheets, graphing, and that sort of thing. Um, it only takes the student uh, a few seconds during first, uh, second contact or third contact. You don't have to do both. Um, it only takes a few seconds of attention, and then uh, the student and the mentor can be free to uh, enjoy the rest of the eclipse. I guess I didn't quite mention this, but uh, the way we take this data is we put a simple diffraction grading over the, uh, over the objective lens of a camcorder. And so that's really all you need is a camcorder and a diffraction grading and a tripod. Um, of course, you need a computer, but most people have access to that either at home or at school. Uh, the diffraction grading only costs a few dollars U.S., so it's, uh, it's pretty cheap once you have the camcorder. However, there's a um, recently came onto the market an instrument called a miniature fiber optic spectrometer, and this is it here. So, and this is a rather standard netbook, so you can see it's pretty small. Um, and it gets its power from the USB cable that it's uh, connected to the computer. And uh, this is the fiber optic input probe. So all you have to do is point that at the source of light that you're interested in finding the spectrum. And uh, the computer takes the spectrum. You can see this spectrum on here. That's actually a test spectrum from a, a, a lamp that we had in the laboratory. I have not used this yet for, a, for an eclipse, but I'm planning to do that uh, perhaps in 2012. So the other kind of experiment I want to talk about is micrometeorological measurements. So as the moon obscures the sun during the partial phases of the eclipse, the ambient light level gets lower, and that makes the temperature uh, drop, and that affects the humidity and the barometric pressure. So all these things change. If there's plants in the area, then you might expect that as the sun goes away, the plant's respiration will cease, so you will see a change in the uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the area. And all of these quantities can be measured using fairly standard equipment, equipment that you can buy um, from, uh, from stores. And uh, the Two main purveyors of such equipment in the U.S. are Vernier Software and Technology and Pasco, and there's their uh, URLs to their, to their websites. Um, and they sell both these smart interfaces that I'll show you in the next slide and also the sensors that are required. So these are three different kinds of smart interfaces that connect sensors to a computer. Uh, this one's called a Vernier Lab Pro, the Lab Quest, and by the company Pasco, this is called an Explorer GLX. Um, this one you have to use with a computer. Uh, you can't program it without a computer. That's why I prefer the Lab Quest. You can program it in the field. You don't have to bring a computer. You can if you want to, uh, but you don't need to bring a computer into the field. And then once you take the data during the eclipse, you can take the LabQuest home and then connect it to your computer and download the information. 
uh, the Explorer works the same way. Um, this is an, an alternative way of measuring some of these uh, micrometeorological quantities called thermocron and hygrocron. And uh, so this is a hygrocron and this is a thermocron. I'll explain the dis difference in a minute. And uh, along with the instruments, you also have to buy uh, a connector to connect it to the computer. And so this is the blue dot receptor and you can just plug these right into the blue dot. The blue dot then gets connected to an adapter, and a USB adapter that you can connect to the computer. And here's a six inch ruler so you can see the size of things that we're talking about here. Uh, that's also a United States penny. So these are very small instruments. Um, we don't need to look at all of this, but this is a comparison of the various different models of thermocron. And uh, most of them, as if you can see, uh, the minimum amount of time between data points is one minute. And that's too long uh, if you have a total phase of an eclipse that only lasts two or three minutes, then you only get two or three data points. But this one costs about $45, um, can take data as rapidly as one data point per second. So that's one that I use and that's called a thermocron. It just measures temperature as a function of time. And what you can do is you can connect it to the blue dot receptor and then program it using a computer. You can program it up to 30 days in advance and uh, then it's got a clock in it and uh, at the appointed time it will wake up and start taking data at whatever rate that you've uh, told it to do. Um, so the hygrocron, it may be a little bit difficult to see it in this picture, but it has a little hole in it. So not only can it measure temperature, it can also measure relative humidity. It costs a little bit more, it's about $85. That little tiny thing costs $85. Um, but it can measure both temperature and humidity. And so this is an alternative way to go. You can't measure carbon dioxide. You can't measure barometric pressure with it. But at least you can measure these two variables. And this is a, a URL to where you get the software that's used to program the thermocron or the hygrocron. And here's a URL for the user's guide for those that are interested. So let's look at some of the data that I've taken over the years. Um, the first time I did an experiment during a solar eclipse, well, I guess if you count Peru, I took some video, but I didn't really do much with it. Um, but what happened was in 1998, uh, I was going to go see this eclipse in Aruba, and some of my friends said that they would like to come along and they would like to bring their children. Uh, but the children couldn't get out of school for a week unless there was some kind of educational purpose. So that's why I started making these, uh, these experiments, so that uh, my friend's daughters, uh, Gracie and Lindsay, Gracie I think was 10 years old at the time, Lindsay was about 14, and so we went to Aruba and we did these experiments. So this is the result of that trip, and uh, here we have just, uh, these are frame grabs from a camcorder, and we printed out so you can see the different phases of the eclipse. Um, as Glenn Schneider pointed out yesterday, it's useful to do polarization. And uh, so all you need to do to take that data is put a Polaroid over the uh, objective lens of your camcorder and then rotate it. So you can see two different uh, rotations. We have the, the Polaroid passing light that's polarized in one direction and then in another direction. And you can see that there is a definite difference in that. And that indicates that there is, that the solar corona um, does emit polarized light. Analyzing that to find out the exact direction of the polarization and the amount of polarization is uh, beyond the scope of uh, what we were prepared to do. So we did not analyze that. But Glenn has uh, offered to help us analyze this data next time we take it. Um, Here's a photograph of the, uh, of the corona during the total phase. Uh, but this is the light and, and temperature data that we took. 
I should mention that we had a little bit of clouds, and that <clears throat> kept the temperature cool. Um, but then after totality, the clouds went away, and so the temperature increased. So I don't like this. I don't think this is a very clean experiment because of the clouds. Uh, if you look at the top scale here, um, the bottom scale is in minutes, and uh, the top scale gives you the percent obscuration of the sun as the eclipse progresses. So right here is the total phase of the eclipse. It's only a couple of minutes long. And you can see that the light does diminish as the moon starts to cover the face of the sun. But it doesn't really start getting dark until about, oh, 75% of the sun is obscured by the moon. And when it starts getting dark, it gets dark very quickly. And then as totality is over, it starts getting light very quickly. Um, and then, of course, as the sun is obscured, the temperature changes. So this is barometric pressure and humidity uh, data that I took in Turkey in 1999. That was a lovely eclipse. We had a nice day for it. Uh, and so again, time on the bottom scale and uh, percent obscuration on the top scale. And so here's the total phase of the eclipse. And you might notice that the big changes don't happen right at totality. The light does. It's darkest right at the middle of totality. But the other variables change uh, not right then. And the reason for that is uh, imagine that you um, go to make some tea. So you put a pan of water on the burner. The burner on your stove is hot, but the water isn't. And it takes a little bit of time for the water to get warm. Similarly, if you take away the sun, it takes a little bit of time for the temperature of the air to change, and also the pressure and the humidity. So here you can see some data that we took. And uh, this is from Zimbabwe. And uh, it was in 2000 that the thermocron and hygrocron came out. Well, actually, the hygrocron was a little bit later. So this is temperatures that were taken with thermocrons. And I had one that was on the ground. That's the black. And I had another one that was uh, 150 centimeters off the ground. That's the red. And one, I think it was 30 centimeters off the ground. And that's the blue. So again, you can see time on the bottom and percent obscuration on the top. And uh, so again, you can see the temperatures changing. Um, and again, here's totality. And the change doesn't happen right at totality, again, because there's some thermal inertia in the air. And this is light. Uh, I had some light sensors pointed at a white sheet on the ground. So we're looking at reflected light. And again, the light does go away um, right at totality. And I had three different uh, colored filters on my light sensors here. So this was red, green, and blue. The calibration of the light sensors was a little bit different. And uh, so that's why they don't all uh, change intensity the same, same way. Uh, but they all reach a minimum at, at the height of totality. And this is light in the sky, also at Zimbabwe. So here I have one light sensor pointed at the zenith, one towards the north, and one towards the east. So the red one is the zenith, and this one is east, and this one is north. Uh, and again, you can see the light goes away. While I was in Zimbabwe, one of my colleagues at the Coast Guard Academy took a student to Zambia for the same eclipse. And uh, her name was Jennifer Imbrez. Um, she's now a professor at the Coast Guard Academy. And uh, she took this data, and you can see um, she's got a little bit different scale here. but Here's where the first contact, so this is the beginning of the partial phase of the eclipse. And then as the eclipse progresses, the carbon dioxide level decreases. I'm not sure I understand that. I would have thought that as the light went away, the carbon dioxide would increase. But you don't need to understand everything. If you understand everything, then why do an experiment the next time? 
So we'll run this experiment another time and see if we can understand this a little bit better. Uh, here's the maximum eclipse, and again, you can see the carbon dioxide uh, takes some while to recover. In 2003, I went to uh, Antarctica for the uh, total eclipse there. Had a little bit of trouble uh, setting my equipment up um, because we were only going to be in the eclipse zone in the path of totality for just a few minutes. And I wouldn't have time to set up my stuff and uh, then take it down. So I set my thermocrons up outside of the path of totality. And you can see that uh, as the sun set, that's one thing. Um, here's the, ex uh, here's the, the time of the eclipse. So maximum eclipse is about halfway in between that. And you don't see much of a change. That's because we were not in the path of totality. Uh, we were several miles outside of the path. Um, so this is actually uh, one day. Uh, as soon as we landed on the airstrip, I set up my thermocrons. And uh, you can see this. Uh, we were in the mess tent as I put my equipment together. And then as I took it outside, it got cold. And then as the sun set, the temperature dropped. And here the sun is very, very, it's almost uh, on the horizon. And then as the sun rises, the temperature comes back. And so this is the, my last slide. Um, it's a little bit unfortunate that there's no simple mathematical models for the way these micrometeorological uh, measurements, how they change. It's not simple. Um, so it's very difficult to compare theory to experiment. The theory is too difficult for uh, most students to do the calculations. Um, on the other hand, as I've been doing, you can discuss this qualitatively and make quite a bit of sense out of the data. Certainly, you can feel the temperature change uh, during an eclipse. And uh, so you can see the temperature change in the data as well. So I think I'll stop there, and uh, I encourage all of you to do an experiment in 2012. Thank you.